Hey, this is John. Thanks for joining me for this build of Bandai's HGUC RX78-2 Gundam. In this episode, I'll cover panel lining the model. Now before I get started into the, I guess you'd say the demonstration proper part of this video, I want to talk a little bit about Bandai plastic. Bandai kits, as I hope the previous episodes of this video have demonstrated, and you may know from your own experience, they fit incredibly well. They, unlike other kits where you, you know, you may put two parts together and there, there may be some, you know, some deviation in how they fit or there may be some gaps. Modern Bandai kits just don't have that. And there's a reason for that. It's, one, they do incredible engineering and, you know, incredible quality control, all of those things that make for a high quality model. But there's also a step that they don't do that's going to have impact on our ability to do panel lining. Now, I've gathered this information through reading on the web and through talking with uh, a couple of friends who were in the plastics industry, not at Bandai, but in the plastics industry. And what they explained to me was that when an injection molded model kit is made, uh, there's a there's a, a mold and plastic is injected into it and once the plastic is injected into it and has a, a certain period of time to cool off and solidify, the mold pops open and the parts sprue, the tree pops out with the, with the model sprue that comes in the kit. Now at that point, most model manufacturers take that sprue and put it through a process called baking. Now, what I've not been able to determine is if it's a physical baking process, like running it through an oven, or if it's a chemical baking process. I've read things that seem to indicate it's both, or could be both. But for our purposes, I guess it doesn't really matter. Um, it, that process hardens the plastic. If you've ever compared the plastic in a Bandai model with, uh, let's say you, you, you have a Hasegawa machining Krieger kit and you compare the plastic in a Bandai model with the Hasegawa plastic. The Hasegawa plastic is much harder, it's much more brittle, um, and it just has a different finish to it, whereas the Bandai plastic is a little softer. Um, I don't want to say it's rubbery, but in comparison to uh, maybe what you might term your traditional model kits, they're a little softer. That baking process that hardens the plastic will also cause the plastic to shrink ever so slightly. Um, I, I read somewhere that it can be as little as 0.03%, but that shrinkage is what causes model kits that are baked to not fit quite as well. Now the manufacturers do their best to try and make up for that in engineering and quality control, and some do a very good job, like Tamiya and Edward and people like that. Bandai has chosen, because so many of their kits they know are going to simply be snapped up. They're not going to be painted heavily, they're not going to be treated like we would a Spitfire or a 57 Chevy where the whole thing is going to be painted. They choose, as I understand, again, as I understand it, not to bake the plastic so that it goes together perfectly. But that means, and I'm actually getting to a point, that means the plastic, because it has not been hardened, is susceptible to damage from many types of thinners. That's the part that we care about for this video. So, <laughs> for this video, what is important is that while I'm going to cover several ways that you can fill in your panel lines to help those stand out if that's if that's what you want to do, um, I'm going to be very careful to point out and to demonstrate how to do it in a Bandai plastic safe way. Because if I used, let's say I used an oil wash that was based on odorless thinner to help it flow, it would work really good on these panel lines. It would look awesome. Um, I mean, it's just, I think it's one of the best ways that you can do it. 
However, if you're not careful and some of that, that wash gets into, especially into an area where there's a joint, like here at the knee, if it gets in there and sits for a while, and, and I mean just, I've had it happen, the few times it's happened to me, I, it's been less than a minute, but you'll bend the part and the, the plastic will just break. Um, one time I had a part that was kind of like this, some of the, the odorless thinner got in there, and when I moved it, it suddenly got really loose and I pulled it apart and it had broken into four pieces. Now, I wiped the thinner off carefully, I let it dry, I glued the pieces back together, everything worked fine. But it is a real issue, it is a real problem that you have to be aware of. So in this video, I'm going to be very uh, deliberate in pointing out techniques that are both friendly to Bandai plastic and if the material used is not friendly to Bandai plastic, I'm going to be real sure to show how you account for that and how you, you take advantage of it so that it doesn't, uh, the Bandai plastic bug doesn't bite you. Was that enough explanation? <laughs> now, when it comes to products that you can use for applying panel lining, there's no way in a single video I could, I could cover every possibility that people use because I've, I've used a lot more than just this and I've heard of people using things that I haven't used. So, you know, if, if you use another technique or another product, hey, please leave it in the comments below so people can potentially try that. For this video, I'm going to kind of confine it to some broad categories. So there are, I'm going to break them into three categories of types of washes that you can use, and I'll demonstrate all of these to a certain extent. One is your, thin, your, your solvent based products, and by solvent I mean something like odorless thinner. Whether that's a premixed enamel wash, uh, like this one from AK Interactive, or it's using uh, tube oil paints or oil brushers or some kind of oil product and then making your own with odorless thinner or even using enamel paints. Um, th those are one class. These are the ones that you have to be careful of because this odorless thinner can damage the, the joints, uh, the pieces the, in the parts in the plastic. Even if you do a really good job of priming the part completely inside and out, these have the potential to cause damage. However, I, I use them and there is a way to use them safely, so I'll talk about that. Another class of products are what I generally are, will classify as water-based acrylic products. Now, they do have some types of solvents in them that are acrylic in nature and those in high enough quantities can be uh, prop can cause problems with Bandai plastic but I haven't had that happen and I've tried to make it happen so I want to put that caveat in there you still don't want to flood your model with an acrylic wash just in case but I've had a lot better uh, uh, results if I have gotten things, if things have gotten a little out of hand from using acrylic washes. And it's things like these Citadel shades or Vallejo model washes or other acrylic and water based products. And then finally, a third class, I guess you'd say, are things where you just literally draw the panel lines in. And it can be uh, something like this, this artistic marker like this. There are purpose-made Gundam markers that that many people use and I quite often use a mechanical pencil. So I'll be demonstrating the mechanical pencil um, because the principle between the mechanical pencil and this little pen are no different and personally I like the mechanical pencil um, just because in my experience these doggone things dry up so fast <laughs> I gave up buying them. But that's, that's the types of products that I think you can lump everything into generally. 
and each one has its own drawbacks and benefits and as I go through it I'll talk about what those are too. Okay, I swear we're going to get to the demonstration part. I, I, we really will. But I feel like in order to, if you're not comfortable with panel lining, if you've never done it before, I feel like that before we can go into the demonstration, it's important to know a whole lot of the background information because if you're equipped with that, I think you'll be able to do panel lining successfully and without fear and, uh, and it'll end up being much better. Because it's actually, if you, know, if you know all of the background information, it's actually a very easy, very fun process. So, what is panel lining? Well, panel lining is simply applying a contrasting product to the various panel lines and shapes of the model so that those shapes become more apparent. Like, for instance, there's this, this section right here on the model, this little rectangular piece, if I'm viewing that from a normal distance, I might not see that. By applying a, a wash that creates a dark outline in those recessed lines, then as the viewer's looking at it, the shapes and parts of the model become more apparent. What it seeks to simulate is in real life, if you were looking at something, there would be a little bit of a shadow there because of the, the, the separation of the parts. We would see that generally in real life from a normal viewing distance. So it's seeking to, to emulate that, but it's also in some cases doing things that may not be true to life. That, you know, if you look at, let's say you're looking at an airliner from quite a distance. You just generally see, you know, if it's flying by, you see a big fuselage and you may see the windows and you, you know, you'll see the tail sticking up and maybe the, the airline's logo on the tail, but you won't see individual details and that's fine for real life. But if you're looking at a model, you want people to see the shapes, the details. So even at more than normal viewing distance, it helps those pop out a little bit. And there's nothing that says you have to do panel lining. So if you just think, you know, I like the model like it is, you could call this finished. Um, it's decaled, it's glossed up. You could say, hey, it's finished. But if you want to go a little further, those panel lining steps will help the details show up, will help the shapes of the model be clearer, and it'll just give a really, in my opinion, a really cool appearance to your model so that all of the work you've put into it will be apparent to the viewer. Okay, the first panel lining method I want to demonstrate is probably the simplest, using this mechanical pencil. Now, this is a half millimeter lead. Um, there's smaller, I'm sure there's probably bigger, uh, but I like using this one because it, it, it's about the right size for most panel lines. However, I do keep a sanding stick handy and I just click out enough lead, if you can see that, that I can just roll it along the sanding stick. And what I'm trying to do there is just get an even finer point. Um, it doesn't have to be perfectly sharp. But then I just simply grab the part, if I can hang on to it, and making sure that it's in focus, I just draw it on, getting right into the panel line. Just draw it in, wipe away any excess like that. Now it works just fine on ridges like this where two parts meet, and you just draw it on there also. You may notice some paint coming up. Generally, that's okay. If you're working with I noticed that if I work when I'm working over uh, lacquer paints, it may take up a little bit right at the place that I'm scribing, and it's usually if there's excess paint. It's usually not the base paint itself, but if the paint has gone into that area kind of thick sometimes, which it will tend to do, it may come up. Acrylics, I've had some acrylics if they were fairly thick start to peel up. 
um, and you may have to keep that in mind when you're trying to work with it. But you just draw them in and it gives, as you can see back here, it gives a nice look to it. Now I quite often use, notice I can get down in there too, really simple. That's where sharpening the lead comes in. And sharpening the lead, I do that as needed. If I'm having trouble getting into the panel line, I go back and sharpen it. If it's working just fine, I leave it be. I also use this, as I started to say, um, before I interrupted myself so rudely, um, I also use this as a basis quite often for later washes. If I want a wash to be really intense and I want to take advantage of, say, what oils, oil washes bring to the table, they're very good, but sometimes when you wipe them off, the if you're, say, using a cotton bud to wipe it off, it'll pull some of the oil out and it won't be as intense or complete. If you pre-shade it with the pencil, then that's going to stay on there and give you a really good high contrast look to whatever you're panel lining. So I, I use pencils sometimes by themselves and sometimes in conjunction with something else. Uh, you know, this is taking me a little longer because I'm doing it around the camera and while talking, but this pencil method is actually really quicker than you'd think. Yeah, you have to touch every panel line. It doesn't flow into it, but when you're done, um, you've got something that's, that's panel lined and works well. If you notice that there's a little bit of a shine to it, if you don't matte coat it later, it will have a little bit of a metallic shine. If that's not something you want, this may not be the best method. Um, if you're not going to matte coat it later, but if you are going to matte coat it, or if you like the shine, then this is, this is a great way to do it. And in a later video where I sh demonstrate chipping, you'll see this pencil show up again. Another method that I'll just talk about briefly um, and just demonstrate this is a spare shield that I have um, and it's so similar to using the mechanical pencil I'm not going to go into a lot of detail but you can use pens and markers um, there are specific Gundam markers that are made uh, and then there's also these that I have from Micron the Gundam markers um, come in a, a wide variety of colors and uh, there's some that are very wide that allow you to color large areas of your Gundam. There's some that are very fine like this, but the principle is the same. You, you simply, like with the mechanical pencil, you simply take your, your, your mark or whatever brand it is and you just draw in. This is a very common method and it's very easy and you get a pretty good looking panel line there very quickly. And it's, it's friendly to the plastic. Um, it's not gonna flow everywhere. Um, it's not gonna create problems. So certainly Gundam markers or alternative markers like these are gonna be a good solution. I've seen them especially be effective on um, bare plastic. If you're snapping up your Gundam and you wanna panel line it, um, these markers are a real quick way to do that. Now another way that you can avoid the Bandai plastic bug is to make use of acrylic washes. And there's, there's a wide variety of them. You can you could make them yourself um, from something as simple as some water, some acrylic paint, and maybe a touch of soap. Um, I've used that in the past. The color is not always as intense, um, but the soap gives you the ability to clean up any excess and um, if you do it over a gloss surface. So that is a possibility. Inks are another possibility. You can combine inks with various uh, flow, flow improvers, I guess you would say, such as water or acrylic medium or something like that. Inks work well, and there's a variety of colors of those. Um, I tend to use either some of these Citadel shades or these Vallejo um, 
uh, weathering products. Now this is, these are designed to be, like this one is oil stains and this one is petrol stains. Basically one's black and one's dark brown. But what I like about them is they're essentially the same thing as the Citadel shades. Um, the difference being these are these come as gloss, they don't come as matte versions. Citadel has matte and gloss available for some of their shades. Either one of these will work. When the surface is glossed like this one is, I especially like using the gloss products because the gloss products have less surface tension so you don't have as much of a problem with tide marks. Tide marks are when you're applying the product into the panel line and some gets on either side of it and leaves a little bit of a stain that can be very obvious. It doesn't blend in easily and unlike oils, it's not as, it's difficult to go back and clean up or blend in, although I'll show you a method for cleaning it up. So um, for this one, I'm going to demonstrate the acrylic products because I think they're a very good alternative that are Bandai plastic safe. So let me get a little more set up and I'll show you how to use them. All right, to start off demonstrating the acrylic uh, uh, panel lining, I'm going to work first, I'm going to work with this Citadel non-oil gloss. Um, I could have used any of the products that I showed just a second ago, but I like the non-oil gloss and so I tend to use it more than the other stuff for panel lining. But all I do is I get some on my brush and, and note that I've got a little pool of water here in a separate brush um, that I just, I keep these standing by in case I need to do some quick cleanup. If you do get it where you don't want it and it's still wet, you can use some water and a separate brush to clean that up and just wipe it off on a paper towel. But I just get this in the brush and then looking around the camera but making sure I'm still in focus. I just apply this in. Now I'm using a liner brush here and it's a cheap liner brush. It's a synthetic brush. So you know I you can use your really nice brushes for this but I, I tend to stick with cheap brushes for things like this because there's no need to spend to, to use up your fancy Winsor & Newton brush or your Raphael or whatever other brand that you paid $15 for um, for something like this. Not that I'm opposed to using nice brushes but I think they have their time and their place and in my opinion this isn't one of them. But I just go in and paint those in and if you're thinking, man, this seems to be taking a while, uh, again, and I know I whine about this a lot, but doing it around the camera um, can make it a bit difficult. But you see, I'm just, I'm just painting that in there, and it gives a nice um, contrasty look. Now you notice a little bit of bleed there. By bleed, I mean some of the color has gone where I don't want it. So what I'm going to do, let me finish this line here. And that little, that little mistake there is perfect. What I do is, once I get it finished, now this stuff will dry pretty quick. Let me clean off my brush while I'm talking and make sure I don't do it in my coffee. Um, I make the mistake of keeping my coffee and my cleaning water off camera, side by side in coffee cups and they're both brown. Um, so I got that going for me, which is nice. You'll notice that there are a few little areas that I got outside the lines. Now, if you're going to be weathering this later, and I am going to be weathering this later, but I want to demonstrate cleanup. If you're going to be weathering this, you can just call that weathering, and if you like it, leave it like it is. But what I will do is give it maybe just a minute or two to dry, and I'll grab some Vallejo airbrush thinner, like that. Now, I probably should have had this in my palette ahead of time, but that's okay. I'll improvise. I'll take that second brush that I had sitting by, 
and I'll get some of the thinner onto the brush. And then on this paper towel, I damp off most of it. Not all of it, but most of it. And then what I do is I go in and in those areas where I've gotten a little extra, I just clean it up. Now it doesn't blend like oils do. It comes up more like, almost like onion skin. It'll, it'll kind of peel up. And every now and then you may have to clean off your brush. But it, it will clean any excess tide marks using that uh, airbrush thinner. Now, the key to this is the paint underneath has to be either protected or impervious to this thinner. And like this paint is lacquer, but I have found if you use enough of this Vallejo airbrush thinner, it can pull up lacquer paint. Um, I tested it. I had to rub on it a lot and it may have been the friction that took it up, but it, it definitely if you're using acrylics underneath, it can affect those. So when I put that, I used Future for my gloss coat, that gloss coat protects the paint and allows me to take up the excess and not worry about the paint underneath. And I suspect, because I've tried this on a non-gloss coated paint, I suspect that using gloss on gloss, because it lowers the surface tension, allows this cleanup um, to take place also. So that's something to, uh, to keep in mind when you're using acrylic products. You can clean them up, but you have to... I only this only dried for maybe a minute or two. I've tested it out to about half an hour and it took me a lot longer to get it up in a few places. I wasn't able to get it cleaned up, but it's it's not it's not permanent once it's on there um, immediately. You have a little bit of time to work with it and that's why I tend to favor this type of acrylic product for panel lining versus oils and enamels though I, I if I had to if I had to talk about the split between them it would probably be 60 percent acrylic 40 percent oils because sometimes if I'm wanting certain effects stains and things like that you just can't beat oils um, for their ability to be spread around oils and enamels so um, but these acrylic products are going to be Bandai plastic safe generally you still don't want to flood the surface you still don't want to just just flood it and get it into the joints because um, that, depending on the thinner you're using, it may cause problems. But it's much safer and much um, much more friendly to the plastic. Okay, next I want to cover oils and enamels. Now, in a lot of ways, they can be interchangeable in terms of if you're using oils or using enamels, you can put some in your palette and thin it with thinner and apply them and they work about the same. Um, personally, I think enamels are a little hotter in terms of their interaction with Bandai plastic. I think oils um, in general are going to be a little less hot um, because they're not, they're not thinned they're not pre-thinned so you're using I guess you'd say a little less thinner um, and my observation is also that some thinners are hotter than others for example I've had people tell me that Humbrol enamel thinner and Tamiya enamel thinner tend to be much more um, tend to be much more unfriendly to Bandai plastic than other thinners what I'm going to start here with first I use either odorless thinner like this. This is from Ammo, but AK makes it and others. Um, I use this and most of the time I use this. It's You can get this. This is from Weber. It's odorless terpenoid. Um, it's One says enamel, one says oil. I actually use these interchangeably. I don't know if it's the same chemical composition. I don't worry too much about it um, because it because it works the same for me. 
I just accept it as it is. Now, one, one product that I do find that I like using for panel lining, especially on Gumpla, are these Ammo Omega Oil Brushers. You can tell this one's seen better days. When they say they're, they're clean and they don't make a mess, try accidentally storing it on its side for six months. Um, you'll find out different. But I like this stuff because it's somewhat pre-thinned oil, but it's still got quite a bit of viscosity to it. It's kind of thick. So you can actually use this and it doesn't flow through the panel line. You can paint it in and then clean up the excess later. So I want to demonstrate using this product specifically and then I'm going to use it to demonstrate how you would do this with oils, enamels, uh, any of those products in general. So hang on a minute and we'll get uh, started on doing that. Alright, I've got some of that oil brusher in my palette here and this is not thinned. I just took the brush, dabbed it a couple of times onto the palette and there it is. Um, and I'm going to use, in fact, this is the same liner brush I've been using for the acrylics. Um, I just cleaned it and dried it. But all I do with this is I go in, hang on, making sure that I'm on camera, and I just paint this into the line. And it's going to be really thick, and it's going to go outside of it. But the beauty of oils is you have a lot of working time. And I can go back and clean that up with a cotton bud. I'll give it a little while to dry, but I can clean that up and use a brush damped with um, my odorless thinner to clean up any excess. And because it's on a gloss surface, it'll clean up nicely. So this can be a really great way if you're worried about working near joints um, or getting it into some areas that it doesn't want, you don't want it to be. This can be a really great way of, you know, starting off and saying, okay, right here around this joint, I'm going to put some panel lining right there using this method and then using this, the method I'm fixing to show after this to get the areas in between or in areas where you're not worried about um, anything getting into joints. So I'm going to give that a little bit of time to dry while I work. And then I'm going to get this thinned down a little bit and just show you, I guess what you'd say, a standard workflow. Okay, I thinned these oils down in the same palette well. Um, and you see the color a little bit better. It's more of a browny, grimy color. And I'm just going to get a little bit of that in there. And I'm going to just damp off most of the excess. And then I'm going to try and get in here and make sure that I'm in focus. And you just touch it to the panel line and it's going to flow pretty well. Now you can make it more flowy I guess you'd say by adding more thinners but I try to keep it under control and not get it too wet because I don't want it flowing too fast. Um, if you're working near a joint, you can start away from the joint and see where it flows and kind of tap it in like that, working towards it. That way you're not just flooding it right in there. But all I'm doing is just applying it in there. And you'll notice that I get a little off on the sides, and that's okay with these oils because they're really easy to clean up, as I'll show you in just a minute. But this, if I were working on any other model um, that I guess you ha would have what you'd say is standard plastic, I would use oils and enamels. That's my preferred go-to, unless I'm needing to really work with some speed. Um, because these dews take several days to dry. These dews, these dews, these do take several days to dry. Um, if I need speed then I'll work with acrylics because they dry in a few hours but the oils and enamels are very very flexible for this panel lining so you saw I was able to just quickly get this in there um, 
uh, just not flooding the surface, being careful to, uh, to always remember that the Bandai plastic bug is waiting to bite you if you get out of control. But that's going to give it a really nice look, I think. All right, let me show you the cleanup process that I use here where I use the, the thicker, unthinned oils. Now, there's several things you can do here depending on the effect you want. If you're wanting it to look grimy, um, look like there's oil coming out of it, a lot of times just taking a Q-tip like that, a cotton bud, and simply bouncing it along the surface, you can kind of spread the oils out. and get a really cool, really grimy effect. If that's the effect you're going for, you can stop right there um, because it, it, it gives it a really grimy, really used effect. And you can go in with a brush and clean it up and tidy up areas that you think don't look like you want. But the oils um, are very flexible. If you're using artist oils out of a tube, you will have probably a day of working time if you're using oils out of a tube that are meant for modeling, you'll have maybe half a day working time in my experience. These oil brushers, they seem to be able to set within a couple of hours and you can have some difficulty getting them up beyond that. So be aware of those working times. But in general, you've got way more than you have with acrylics. So anyway, you can dab it on like that, dab it around and get a certain look. If you want a little more of a clean pan line look, let me flip ends here, you can just wipe that off. And come in from either direction, and I'm just wiping up and down. And because that surface has been glossed, it pulls up most of that color. Now, if you need to clean it up a little bit, just simply get a brush dip it in some odorless thinner, which I have right here in my palette, and then, kind of like I did with the acrylic, you just go in and you clean up those edges, just like that. And every now and then, just clean your brush off in the thinner and damp it on the, tap it on the towel, and you can go through and clean off that excess color if you don't want it there. So this method, and I'm not going to go through and get it super clean because this is going to be weathered up later. So this is a really, really good method of uh, especially working near joints, of making sure the stuff doesn't flow everywhere, but you still get the benefits of oils and enamels, uh, or of oils and their flexibility. Now cleaning off the other side that worked on. I'm just going to use the same q-tip I've been using. This is really easy because there's not a lot there. You just wipe it off like that. And I, I mean that's that's it. It's it's like that old Jeff Goldblum you know Mac commercial about you know hooking up a Mac. Although I'm I, you know, he said, he said it, you know, it's as simple as, you know, it's two steps. You plug it in and then he's like, oh, that's it. That's it. It's done. You, you plugged it in. Um, you just wipe it off. And if you wipe off too much, you can go back and apply it again. This is why sometimes I like going in first with pencils um, because it darkens that line down. And if I get too much off, then I've still got some color there. But I have the ability to, as I showed on the other side, to not just wipe it all off, but to kind of dab it along and to make a, a more grimy stained appearance on the, the the surface of the model. All right, I know that was a whole lot of talking, but I wanted to make sure I demonstrated a variety of methods that you can pick from for panel lining your Gundam. Um, so just to kind of recap, there's pencils and markers which are really easy. Uh, they sometimes, I've had, the only difficulty I've had with those is just simply getting them into certain nooks and crannies. Um, sometimes it can be easier to use other products for that, but they're a very, very good. They can be a secondary solution, a basis that other things will go on top of, or they can be your primary go-to. So 
Um, they're a very good option. Acrylic products are also a very good option. They're also much more Bandai plastic friendly. They do have uh, one major drawback which you have to be very you have to be very careful about the cleanup and um, what you're applying them over if you're applying them over a matte surface and they do a little bleeding um, where the color spreads a lot they can be incredibly difficult to clean up at that point um, but over a glossed surface over a nice you know a smooth satin surface they work really well they're not going to get you in trouble with Bandai plastic generally, and uh, they give you a nice look. And then, of course, you've got oils and enamels um, and working with odorless thinner, and they bring a lot to the table. They're much more flexible in terms of being able to smear them around and play with them a little bit, and you have longer working times. But as I said, the drawback can be that those thinners can introduce some problems if they get into joints and other points of articulation on your gun plug. My recommendation would be try all of them because there are circumstances that when I'm working on a model I'll find that okay I'm gonna I'm gonna use a little bit of this here and a little bit of that there and I'm gonna use this color here and this technique there so it can be used interchangeably across a suit so experiment with all of them and treat them as tools in your toolbox. One, just like when you're working on your house or in your yard or something, you know, there's a certain times when you need a hammer and there's other times you need a rake and other times you need an ax. Use the appropriate tool for the job um, and experience will teach you when and where uh, one is better to apply than the other. Well, thank you so much for joining me for this video, this continuation of the series uh, on building a Gundam. We're getting this guy uh, further along, and uh, uh, quite honestly, if you were building your Gundam along with this, or you're, you're contemplating working on one, this can be a, a good stopping point. Some people want their Gundam to be clean, to be... Um, you know, nice and shiny and factory new looking. So when you get it painted and get some gloss on there and get decals on it and get your panel lining done, this can be a viable point at which you might want to give it a matte top coat or a gloss top coat, which whatever type of top coat you want, and call it done. Uh, so, you know, this can be a break point um, in, in the workflow of building this. But I'm going to take it further, of course, and the next episode is going to cover, uh, we're going to start into the weathering and all, and I'm going to start by doing uh, chipping, and I'll cover that uh, thoroughly in the next video, so be sure and click the little subscribe uh, icon down there below and the little bell so you'll know when that comes out. How do you like that segue? That was pretty cool, wasn't it? Um, be, sure, be sure and subscribe, and uh, so when that next video comes out, you'll be able to keep up with that. And thank you so much for supporting me on social media. If you follow me there on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, or if you keep up with my blog, thank you for doing that. I do have a Patreon account. There's a link down below uh, to that. If you would like to support the work that I'm doing, I would be most grateful. And if you're already a Patreon supporter, you, you, know, you know what you mean to me because I try to convey that, and I hope I do a good job of it. But I'll say it again. Thank you so much because... You make this possible. Um, we just couldn't afford for me to do modeling at the pace and volume I do with the variety of products that I do if it wasn't for your help. So thank you very much. And with all that being said, happy day to you, friends. Bye-bye.